Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 415. Once again, the Legal Advice Edition. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm Alan Haley. And today is July 5th, 2018. Alan, we had a big <laughs> announcement in the legal world last week, and I assume you were in your RV Airstream having fun somewhere. I just have headed off on vacation as usual, right. <laughs> um, but one of the but things not, not much has happened in the interim so we're okay <laughs> <laughs> one of the uh, um, interesting things is every time there's an election uh, people say I don't care what the guy thinks or the lady thinks it's the Supremes uh, <laughs> we, get, we care about who's going to be the uh, in charge of the Supreme Court because uh, they interpret the laws that are passed by uh, the Senate and Congress and we want the interpretation to be original as the well, creators and forefathers intended we don't want them to legislate from the bench and uh, i've taken that to heart i voted ronald reagan i was very happy to do so but i've noticed in my little uh wall of history here especially legal history that a president uh, doesn't always get who they hope for when they nominate uh, a Supreme Court judge. That's, that's uh, correct. I think Kennedy was thought to be a little bit more conservative than he came off to be. Or Judge Souter was the perfect jurist who would yeah. uh, always go with the conservatives. And um, yeah, the, In fact, when it was announced that uh, Judge Souter was to be a nominee, they found him in the law office so they could tell him. Uh, or <laughs> a, a law library. And so uh, I, I understand the desire to always have... Uh, a person uh, nominated by the president, but sometimes you, you don't get what you want. However, looking at the candidates, the, the top four or five here from Donald Trump, um, I'm kind of impressed. I thought I'd get you on, on camera here to talk about it. Uh, first, this is going to be Donald Trump's second. That's uh, above average for most presidents. That's correct, and at least this early in his first term, right? And um, that's because during eight years of Obama, there were only two vacancies. So now they're, they've built up and the ages have gotten up to the point where uh, people are in their 80s on the Supreme Court still. And it takes something to hold out <laughs> and continue to meet the judge's schedule and everything like that after you're 80. I know, I know from, as I'm getting close to, you know, I'm still about six or seven years away from that, but I'm I'm feeling very tired. <laughs> <laughs> so if Trump gave you a call and we would love that, <laughs> you would, you'd have to decline. <laughs> I'd have to decline, plus I'm sure they would um, skewer me with all my years of blog writing, so we'll just have to. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's one of the interesting things with the Chief Justice. He was automatically promoted to Chief Justice because they didn't want to go through the whole rigmarole again of uh, going before the the Congress and trying to get this guy or Senate and get this guy reapproved. Well, no, Chief Justice Roberts had to be confirmed again. Oh, he did. You, okay. Yeah. Once you uh, just because if you're moving from one position on the court to another, that's a that's a new appointment. But uh, the um, yeah, they they haven't had. Good luck with, um, you know, as I say, Eisenhower, I think, was surprised by what happened to Warren after he appointed him. And uh, as you mentioned with uh, Reagan and, um, or rather, Reagan and Kennedy, yeah, and Bush and Souter. So it's it, it's kind of a, um, a, you know, that's the problem is applying this litmus test to all these candidates. You can't do it, actually, in conformity with the requirements of the judicial ethics and neutrality it is it's unethical for a judge to give his opinion on a case before it comes before him of course that doesn't bother justice ginsburg who talked about the uh, affordable care act long before it got up to the, uh, the supreme court and she she did not recuse herself but uh, upheld it as a law she said as she had already said she was going to do so as I say, when you get to be 80, well, I guess you don't care about whether the rules apply anymore, but it, they do apply to all the candidates. And so the candidate has no business answering a question like, will you overrule, vote to overrule Roe v. Wade? Proper answer to that is, I don't know, I can't say because I don't have a case in front of me, and I will have to judge the case that comes in front of me. And if the case were in front of me, I still couldn't answer. No, I couldn't answer until it's decided. Once yeah. it's decided, you'll have my opinion on it. 
but I'm not going to speak about a pending case. And, uh, and that's just judicial ethics. So uh, this whole confirmation business, it, it got really got political after Bork. I mean, we can thank uh, Tom, rather, it's, uh, Ted Kennedy for that. And um, every, since then, every nomination has been political football, trying to draw out the nominee to, um, to say, get something that you can then use against them. And, and succeeding in, or in most of the cases, falling well short, as they did with Robertson's confirmation hearing. So wow. this is going to be interesting, because we've got um, all of the candidates that are being closely considered right now are sitting uh, circuit judges and have been confirmed earlier in the earlier hearings by the Senate. Uh, and so they've all passed through the confirmation process, and they have their track records, uh, several of them going back 10 or more years, like Kavanaugh and uh, Kethledge, and uh, of course Amy Barrett's only seven seven months. But, you know, that's um, nevertheless, she, and she had the most recent confirmation hearing uh, last October, I think it was, when she was confirmed by a vote of 55 people in the Senate. So, and their Senate that, hasn't changed that, much. That goes right to the nastiness. I remember mm -hmm. Diane Feinstein grilling her over her dogma. Yes, you know, and yes. I just saying that the church has dogma, right? Well, uh, Feinstein is not exactly noted for her uh, observance of Catholic doctrine in her practice. So um, <laughs> I don't know. It, it was kind of a case of a pot trying to call a kettle black, and it wasn't even a a, a pot worthy of it at that point. But it's a uh, yeah, she did not come off well in that, and I think anybody who tries a religious test, a litmus test like that, you know, there's a clause again in the Constitution that there shall be no religious oaths or uh, as a test of office in the United States. So you cannot use religion as a basis for deciding whether someone's qualified to hold office or not. Well, when, when President Trump was campaigning, and this is where it's going to get difficult, he said he was going to seek uh, judicial candidates who would overturn Roe v. Wade. And he would well, ask them about their uh, opinion on Roe v. Wade in their interviews. That makes it very difficult um, for candidates if they, if they know that they're going to be asked that question. Yeah, and as I say, you can't, even if you're, no matter how much you want to be appointed, you can't answer that question in a direct fashion and be worthy of the office. So I don't know how Trump is going to ensure himself. What's interesting is that the um, first two lists that Trump published of candidates um, as judge, judges um, that he would nominate did not include Kavanaugh. Mm. Um, and so, and Kavanaugh is probably the um, safest one to, uh, for him to appoint in terms of a proven conservative track record and one who could be counted on at least to re-examine the basis for Roe v. Wade, if not overrule it. Um, and so, Cap but uh, there's nothing that Kavanaugh has written, as far as I know, against Roe v. Wade. So we would have to take a look at uh, his judicial record on that. But he's probably the one that would be the most plain Jane, straightforward appointment if, if Trump wants to go in along the lines of Gorsuch and get a true judicial conservative. Um, at the same time, he is, some people appointed, bad optics for Trump because he likes his optics. Uh, Kavanaugh, if I, think, if I serve, if my memory serves, I think his wife was George Bush's secretary when he was governor, hmm. and um, so he's close. There, he's closely allied to the Bush family, and that, of course, does not sit well with Trump. Um, okay. Well, but, nor many conservatives. No, and well, but as I say, Kavanaugh's conservative credentials are beyond question. Okay. His, his opinion, the opinions he's written, you can rest easy on that. Even. Uh, I, I forget. Well, Ann Coulter doesn't like some things that he wrote on uh, on immigration, but um, be that as it may. It's, um, uh, well, let's talk. The reason we're talking about this is the decision of 1974 Roe v. Wade. And yes. um, obviously, I disagree with the decision. I think uh, it is not a matter of uh, uh, privacy. Uh, and uh, I don't think you can. I, I don't even dignify it with the word decision. It's, yeah. it's another one of those ones like Obergefell that is just emoting yep. uh, what a justice strongly feels should be correct instead of uh, deciding to what the Constitution actually should govern and, and say. 
and there's no has no business in in the federal constitution dealing with the matters of abortion which have always been state law issues well let's talk about the roe v wade the case um mm -hmm. a person uh, wanted to have the ability to terminate her pregnancy um even though she won the case she never got that ability um, no, uh, it just one of those things that happens uh, interestingly she converted to become i think uh, very religious yeah, if she, not catholic she uh, wanted to get rid of the nightmares and the, the demons that bothered her at night and uh, mm -hmm. she became baptized and a christian and uh, uh, a little bit of an evangelist for a little while uh, before she passed on uh, right praise wow um however let's talk about the how this law is a failure and can be overturned okay well you know it's a failure in the sense that it's allowed 60 million babies to be murdered in the womb mm -hmm. uh, since it's hand down the number just keeps climbing astronomically ever since but it it did of course what the the activists got it through the court because they couldn't get it through any of the legislatures and that's been the technique of the of the real progressive activists with counting on activist judges like Blackman was to do their work for them and announce it as a matter of Supreme Court law when it of course has nothing to do with the uh, federal constitution. Anyway, the um, so it's very hard to overturn now because it's enshrined by the Supreme Court. However, it's just a majority of five to four and of course cases that are decided by five to four can always be decided five to four the other way and uh, can be revisited and and rescinded or uh, overruled as they say so it can you're never sure with a five to four majority if you've got something to say and that's why they're going to fight tooth and nail to try to ensure that this hangs on but they're really just hanging on by their fingernails now it's such a poor decision poorly reasoned decision to begin with no judge can uh, cite it with any kind of integrity and say that this is what is principled and according to the Constitution the business about trimesters made up whole out of whole cloth completely because he sent I understand Blackman spent the summer in the library at the medical school at uh, University of Minnesota and it all came out of his study there he was figuring out some framework he was gonna he just crafted the whole thing legislated the whole thing from the bench and so it's one of the worst examples of judging in the history of the Supreme Court uh, probably second only to Obergefell. <laughs> All right. The, the now, recent marriage decision. If uh, Trump gets his uh, judge through, and a, I guess I can't get nominated now. Right? You no, know, <laughs> it's all over for you. <laughs> if Trump gets his just justice through, and sometime in the next couple of years this uh, uh, case gets revisited by the court and it's overturned, that does not end abortion in America. No, unfortunately, what it does is, well, it's going to be interesting because, you know, if you take the logic of Obergefell about how much the uh, First Amendment protects the rights, and if, if you overturn Roe v. Wade on the ground that a fetus is a person, even though not yet born, but it's life, it's living, uh, then, and the protection of the uh, amend First Amendment and Fifteenth Amendment uh, go to people, all persons of all you know, he can't be deprived of life without due process of law. Fourteenth Amendment, sorry. And the, you can't be deprived of life. And if that applies to fetuses, then you're not going to be allowed, even if a state won't be allowed to uh, enact an abortion law, if the doctrine is, if it goes that way. And this is where, see, this is how the abuse of the Fourteenth Amendment and these most recent decisions, it, it's a two-way street. Kennedy used the 14th Amendment, equal protection and uh, due process, to strike down the marriage laws in all, all the states that said marriage was between a man and a woman. Uh, an extreme ruling and an extreme application of the amendment. But you could do the same thing if you were just inclined on the other side to say, okay, now we're going to overrule Roe v. Wade and hold that a fetus is a person and you can't deprive a person of life or liberty under the 14th Amendment. So therefore, no state can sanction any kind of abortion. Uh, now that's an extreme view. <laughs> well, the other way, but it shows. It's, it's, I've chosen I would it support to that, but I think they would want to compromise and just send this back to the states. Yeah, it will have to work its way out. And as I say, it's uh, overruling Roe v. Wade will simply strike down a, a law that uh, 
you know, allows abortion in the third trimester or something like that and say, no, you have to rethink it in the light of view that life begins at conception mm -hmm. and a life has to be protected. But well, some states have, have to, opted, well, like stop, some, one or two, have opted for the heartbeat law. Yeah, and as I say, they're going to have to be very careful how they define it because once they say that uh, you can't abort something with a heartbeat, then th that means it's, yeah, they, they are going to have to um, observe the life of that fetus in, in the womb and protect it. So it's going to be interesting to see which way it goes here. And we're all hoping that the Christian principle of life is, is a gift from God it, is upheld here and applied as it should because it's been a, a national disgrace. I just weep through all the uh, unborn lives we've wasted in this process and people view procreation as sort of a recreation sport because you don't have to worry about the consequences. You can always get uh, get eliminated, whatever un inconvenient product results from it. Well, uh, I, as I've said before, you know, we're living on the other side of the sexual revolution. Uh, yeah. It's destroyed our university systems. It's destroyed uh, our judicial systems. It's destroyed, you know, exactly how we, we treat the unborn. And, yeah, uh, and the, there's, I don't know if we can ever really get uh, back on track after that. Um, the fact that there are so many people fighting so um, hard, hard for this and fiercely uh, to get this ensconced view of uh, the cheapness of life written into the Constitution for all time. I don't know. They should try. If they really think they can do it, let them propose a constitutional amendment. Uh, saying abortion is a perfectly legal way of going about things. See how far they get with that. I, I don't think they can. That's the problem. See, they, they don't want to respect. They would be about four or five states short. They don't want to respect the democratic process. They just want to get it done the simplest, easiest way they can by appointing justices. So this is going to be interesting because I don't see any of these three justices uh, that are narrowed down the list to as being anyone who will support Roe v. Wade in terms of it just has no integrity, as I say, for someone who respects the rule of law. So it's going to be, they won't be able to say that in the hearing, and it's going to be a, a spectacle to see, depending on whom he selects finally, uh, how the left in the Senate goes about this and how Murkowski and Collins um, purport to exercise their senatorial duties to advise and consent. And, you know, I should point out, too, when Collins and Murkowski say they won't uh, vote in favor of anyone who would overturn rule v. Roe v. Wade, they're not really advising and consenting at all. They're abandoning their constitutional role, and they're, they're saying this is a veto. Uh, it, the Senate has a veto over an appointment, and uh, if we don't like, happen to like the person's philosophy. And that's what's been killing the whole process ever since uh, Robert Bork. Yeah, senators' ideas that they can just pick and choose uh, people because they like them or don't like their philosophy. Well, I want to talk about something that's really ironic here as we finish up. Um, you remember first wave and second wave feminism. We want to vote. We want to work. We want to be treated equally as man. As man. We kind of want to have it all. We want to be able to marry, have a family, and have a career. Right. Well, there's one candidate here that's uh, being nominated who fits that uh, perfect image. And, and who am I talking about? <laughs> You're talking about Amy Comey Barrett. And she's, she's a marvelous woman, um, an Orthodox Catholic who has uh, practiced what she preaches and mm -hmm. uh, has five or six children. I'm not sure how many I've read about recently. A lot. But <laughs> a lot. <laughs> that's a good, and she's brought up that family in a devout Catholic household, while at the same time clerking for Justice Scalia uh, and for Lawrence Silverman on the Court of Appeals in the D.C. Circuit, and uh, being a professor of law at uh, Notre Dame, where she won the annual Best Teaching Award two years going. Her students loved her as the way she taught the classes and paid attention. And uh, so she's, she's served on the... Um, committee on the advisory committee on the federal rules of appellate procedure. So she does her, puts her time into the official uh, unpaid duties of the judicial office. Mm -hmm. And she contributes her part. Everybody admires her. She writes beautifully, uh, very clearly, and uh, she doesn't waste words. 
you know, she's your ideal person that you could ask for as a justice. As I read somewhere that uh, you, can, you just don't get better than this. The problem is I say that she's a woman for some people. And the other problem, of course, is that she's Roman Catholic. Um, and I don't know that, um, as I say, it's a disgrace if you use either of those categories as a reason for discrediting her, uh, casting a vote against her. But um, we will have to see because she's she's clearly, I mean, as I say, Trump may find it more the better part of, of Ballard not to use her at this point and to throw her into the fray, which will use her up for all time. Mm -hmm. She couldn't make, then be a point later where he could probably easily get her, more easily get her confirmed if she were replacing, say, Ruth Ginsburg um, or uh, Sonia Sotomayor or whatever. But in other words, a woman's seat on the court. And um, <clears throat> so for him to use her now would be meaning that he would not necessarily be respecting a woman's seat later on. He could say, I took care of it when I appointed uh, Judge Barrett, and now if Ruth Ginsburg retires or if Sotomayor retires, yeah, I see he that. could appoint a man. Yeah, so yeah. it's going to be something. But as I say, you can't really get higher endorsements really from uh, anyone than she has received. Well, I imagine there's a whole bunch of liberals really trying to keep Ruth Gator alive, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> just like. <laughs> <laughs> here energy drink here you know you can yeah, do it she's, well she's pretty tough she's pretty tough <laughs> um as the uh, uh, general convention is going on this week in austin and when this finishes up i think you and i are going to want to talk about some new canons or new bylaws um Ooh, and, or, and what they're doing with the prayer book and the and the language of yeah, you know is god male what happens to a bishop when he refuses to perform a same-sex marriage in his diocese? I right. think that will all will be interesting topics for next time. I'm Kevin okay. Paulson. And I'm Alan Haley. And this has been episode 415 of Anglican Unscripted.